good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Tim Lee. I'm a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on silver exploration as well as gold and copper exploration and development today. We will hear from Chris Wright, Chairman and CEO, and Doug Cavey, Vice President of Exploration of Defiance Silver. During today's webinar, they will provide an overview and outlook. Then we will take questions and you can type your questions into the chat box at any time and we'll get to as many as we can. Before we kick things off, first uh, we need to discuss some fine print during this uh, Defiant Silver webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined on page two of the Defiance corporate presentation that can be found on the company's website, defiancesilver.com. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on defiance. So we have Defiant Silver presenting today. The company is focused on silver exploration in a historic major mining camp in Zacatecas State, Mexico, where they're finding that in spite of centuries of mining, there's plenty of silver still to be discovered. Uh, the company also has a gold and copper project in Michoacan State, Mexico. Uh, with that, I now turn it over to Chris and Doug to update our audience on the company. Good. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having us. and Thank you, everybody, for attending. As, um, as Tim mentioned in his uh, kind introduction, uh, that we will be making forward-looking statements, so please keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. Um, Defiant Silver is a Mexican-focused uh, exploration and development company. Uh, we're fortunate to have two legitimate standalone company-making assets. Um, our legacy asset, uh, which came to the company um, uh, back in 2011 or so is our uh, Santa Cassia, or now we call it our Zacatecas Silver Project. Um, this project is located in the state of Zacatecas, just outside of the city of Zacatecas, which is geographically right smack dab in the middle of Mexico. This, um, this project came to us with a small starter resource, resource of approximately 17 million ounces of silver. Um, we own this uh, project either 100% outright um, or we have um, an option to acquire 100% of the land that we, we are working on. Um, it is a very advanced asset. We're, uh, we've been uh, actively exploring and drilling it uh, with the current uh, drill program started in um, December of 2021. Um, I beg your pardon, 2020. Um, and uh, we had drilled uh, more than 10,000 meters last year. Um, we are just wound up our, uh, our, just started up our drilling again after the Christmas break, and uh, things are progressing quite nicely there. I'll let I'll let Dougie fill you in on on the process, uh, the progress that we've made so far on this uh, this last last bit of drilling. Our other project is located in the state of Michoacan, which is about uh, four and a half hours southwest of Guadalajara, which is uh, Mexico's second largest city. Um, the Tapal Gold Copper project is also a very advanced project. Um, it has a previous feasibility study from 2012, a, uh, a PEA done in 2013, and that was again uh, updated in 2017. Um, the project has a 1.8 million ounce uh, measured and indicated gold um, resource and more than 800 million pounds of copper. Um, we own this project also 100% outright. Um, in the uh, in at the end of 2020, we actually struck a deal with the vendors to uh, reacquire the uh, two and a half percent royalty on the project, and then earlier in uh, early in 2021, uh, we struck uh, an agreement to more than double the land package around the project. So we're starting off uh, from a very robust resource base. Um, obviously, with our, our Tapal asset base, a very strong position to be kicking off from. We also believe that there's a tremendous amount of upside at, at both projects through the drill bit. Um, I joined the company um, as, uh, well, I first got involved with the company back in, in 2014 as an investor. My firm, Windermere Capital, um, invested in the company uh, when it was quite distressed. We took a large stake, really with an eye to help uh, guide the company through what was a, uh, a difficult market. 
protecting the asset, uh, the Santa Casio at that time, and, and trying to move it along slowly as, as, uh, as the market conditions would allow. Um, in the spring of 2019, I actually joined the board of directors as chairman. Shortly thereafter, I took on the role of CEO. And one of my first tasks, uh, you know, coming coming inside in the company was really to find out what was it that the company actually had. So um, that's where Doug and the team at Orquest come into the into the story. Um, I wanted to find a, a group of, of excellent, experienced, um, uh, technical people who knew Mexico inside and out and could come in and objectively tell us, you know, what these assets, uh, what we really had with these assets. You know, should we keep them? Should we uh, should we deal them? And if we were going to keep them, how do we move move uh, them forward? Uh, I'm happy to report that uh, you know they they uh, were were very happy with what they they saw and they've designed a, a tremendous uh, program for us to move these forward and have since then signed on full time to be our our geo uh, geological team. So we've had a complete turnover in management, complete turnover in in the technical team since since uh, since I became involved. Um, and we've got uh, we've got uh, the horses uh, you know to bet on to, to move these projects forward. You know our projects are also uh, uh, very leveraged to the price of underlying commodities. Um, you know I think it's it's a little cliche in, in that you know I would expect that most precious metal exploration companies would say that. Um, we'll walk you through the economics on our Tapal uh, project and show you the price sensitivity there and let you decide for yourself um, how good you think it is. We we think it's really quite attractive though. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, my firm had uh, taken a large stake in in, uh, in the company back in 2014. We still are the largest shareholder with a little more than 20% of the company. Um, we have uh, had some some success over the last year and a half almost with uh, with financing. We've diversified our shareholder base quite significantly with a quite a number of uh, well-known institutions coming into into the company. Um, Many of them on on multiple occasions through the financings. Uh, we've raised uh, we've raised in the last uh, fifteen or sixteen months between uh, our two financings and warrants being exercised in excess of thirty million dollars. Um, so having such a strong uh, core shareholder in our firm, also with strong institutional shareholders and and insiders, uh, we have we're starting from a very strong shareholder base to uh, to build this company going forward. Um, and uh, as uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're actively drilling. Work is ongoing. We've had we've had news uh, coming out pretty steadily since since the spring of last year. We expect to see more come. The drills are continue to turn. So it's an exciting time for us um, at the company with with lots going on. Um, our share structure is pretty pretty straightforward. Um, we have about 220 million shares outstanding. Um, our treasury is in very strong position. We have um, 16 million dollars. In the bank, so our, our exploration programs are fully funded. We have a lot of flexibility to uh, to be able to uh, accelerate those, expand those programs, if uh, if that's what we decide uh, based on the results that we get. That's uh, that's going to be a, the decision of the technical team and 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 uh, solely dependent on, on the results that we get. Um, the uh, the stock price, the last finance that we did was in June of last year. We raised eleven and a half million dollars at ninety cents a share. With a half warrant at a dollar thirty-five, uh, we've seen our stock price uh, in in the fall and the tax loss selling uh, suffered along with uh, just about everybody else in the sector. I think that's more a function of um, of the uh, of of what's going on in the sector rather than something that is directly attributable to the company. Um, so an interesting time to be uh, to be looking at this story for those that want to get exposure to to this space. So with that, what I will do is I'll let Doug uh, take over and walk you through our two projects, and um, we'll look forward to taking your questions at the end. Great. Thanks, Chris. Welcome, everybody. Thank you to Red Cloud for putting this on. We're uh, happy to provide an update. We did put a bit of news out at the beginning of the week, uh, just where we're at with our projects, and I'll talk a little bit to that uh, as we move forward. But just to take a 50,000-foot view on where we are and who we are, um, I'm sitting in Zacatecas right now, Zacatecas City. Um, Zacatecas State, arguably one of the most world's most important mining jurisdiction. And then this pen of silver mineralization or the belt of silver, silver mineralization is arguably the world's most important silver mining jurisdiction. Uh, we're about 40 kilometers away from the Fresnillo mine. Fresnillo and the mining complex there is the world's largest primary silver mine. 
right next door to Fresnio is Mag Silver's Juana Scipio project. It's a joint venture between Mag and Fresnio that's under development. I think it's almost reached full commercial production. Uh, when that project reaches for full commercial production, it will be the world's largest primary silver mine. Uh, other notable projects in the area include La, uh, La Colorada, Pan American Silver's flagship silver mining operation, uh, a number of uh, other large operations in that Zomberete district, as well as we're about two and a half hours south of Gold Corp's Penasquillo mine, uh, Mexico's largest open pit gold mine, and Camino, uh, or, uh, Orla Mining's Camino Rojo project, which is one of Mexico's newest uh, operating gold mines. So uh, jurisdictionally, very favorable. Um, Mexico is the largest silver producing country in the world. Zacatecas State is the largest silver producing state in Mexico. So uh, right address, and we like to think, you know, the best place to look for silver is where it is. Um, we have a variety of, of land positions really in the main Zacatecas district and a variety of ownership over those positions. So in 2018, we purchased Meg Silver's Zacatecas district land holdings. It was an all, cat or an all stock deal. Uh, with that came a 1300 square kilometer database of the district. Um, we have the main Santa Casio project where our resource area is located. And then we have the Lucita project, which we recently optioned off Pan American Silver and where we have been doing the uh, drilling as of recent. So our resource area is located in the main um, Santa Casio project. And then the Lucita area is where we've been doing some drilling. The thesis for us is that this project is like Fresnio from the 1960s. So Fresnio in the 1960s was out or it was in marginal or mostly out of mill feed. They took a more philosophical approach, a discovery focused geoscience approach and began to look for additional mill feed. And in 1975, uh, as a result of a substantial amount of surface work and underground work, they found the Santo Nino vein. Santo Nino was 1,000 grams silver, 1.6 grams gold and a percent combined lead zinc. Um, in our initial first pass, we noticed that there is a number of very high grade and similar metal tenor uh, as these results from Santo Nino. And why that's important is it turned the lights back on for Fresnio and it kicked off 40 years of spectacular exploration, development and mining results, uh, most recently highlighted by the results uh, at Mag Silver's Juan Escipio project, which will eclipse Fresnio as the largest silver mine. So we know that stepping into these districts, testing the productive structures, really outlining which are the productive structures uh, lead to very uh, substantial exploration and development discoveries. Um, up until Fresnio had made these discoveries in the in early 1970s, uh, Zacatecas district where I'm sitting right now had produced more or more silver than the Fresnio district. Uh, Fresnio is now about a 8 billion ounce silver district. Uh, Zacatecas is still sitting at about a billion ounce of historical production. But that proof of concept of testing these productive structures, not only did it work for Mag Silver at Fresnio, it worked to uh, the benefit of our neighbor, uh, Capstone Mining's Cozumine Mine, where they're over a thousand meters into their mineral system. Uh, whereas when they started that operation and they bought that operation in the early 2000s, uh, they had a very marginal and shallow resource that had been developed on that property. So we know these structures are productive. We know the history is there. It's just seen a paucity of modern exploration. And I think that's where we're seeing the success to date. So we follow a very linear exploration approach using discovery focused geoscience, building 3D models and testing these systems at depth and testing the controlling structures on the system. And that's what we identified through an aggressive mapping program uh, done in uh, early 2021, late 20, early 2021. And we found that there was a number of what we think are the controlling structures of the main Veda Grande resource area, or the main Veda Grande mine. Um, this mineral system itself has produced over 150 million ounces of silver. And it's never really been drill tested below the 150 uh, meter elevation. Uh, there's some small mines that are about, a, not small mines, there's some pretty significant mine infrastructure that's down about 170 meters. Uh, but there's really, a, again, a paucity of drilling testing the uh, full limits of this uh, mineral system. The line I just drew on this image is about the approximate elevation of the current resource estimate at the Santa Casio project. And you can see from the drilling that we released in uh, late 20 or sort of middle 2020, September 2021. Um, we uh, outlined uh, a substantial body mineralization below the current resource estimate. Why that's important for us is we have been doing oriented core drilling. Um, we have been uh, getting real-time drill information and testing what we think are the controlling structures. Our technical team here on the ground has a lot of experience in big systems geology and big systems thinking, as well as resource building in these epithermal systems, which is quite important. 
Uh, this is a long section through the deposit. Um, you can see there is a building body of mineralization well below the current resource estimate, which is that hash lined about halfway down the page. We've got drill holes testing the mineralization about 250 meters below that resource estimate. Uh, you can see there's a very clearly defined body, and we think that's the controlling structure there. Uh, when we tested that controlling structure, when we had a little bit of a better understanding with the surface mapping and oriented drilling, uh, we came back with the highest grade results to find silver's drill to date on the property, uh, wide widths, of economic grade mineralization, uh, and high grade mineralization nested in between those wide widths. Um, Infrastructure is great on this asset. It's a 500 year mining camp. The area is actually seen uh, long, longer than 500 year mining history. Uh, but because there's such a good, and it is a mining center, it's truly a mining center in Mexico, um, because it's seen this long life of mining, um, there is you know, power on site, the highest grade hole we've drilled on the property. Uh, it's drilled underneath a power line, next to an open pit. It's around uh, substantial existing infrastructure. And uh, you can see a you know, uh, tailings facility in the background. Uh, most of the, the land in this picture is either owned outright by us or that we have an option to acquire 100%. Um, one of the key pieces of infrastructure on this asset is the underground development that's here. And that's one of our um, advances for the next 12 months is to establish safe underground access, particularly with the focus of getting into these um, structures that look to have been a bit displaced from the original mining, which is likely why the old time miners hadn't found them, um, get into them and start to begin to get underground utilizing and, and uh, creating some optionality with that substantial underground infrastructure on the asset. Um, as Chris mentioned, as I was saying, we uh, entered into an agreement with uh, Pan American Silver to option a 100% ownership of their Lucita project. Uh, Lucita is a very important land package for us. Um, we had a large regional database that we got from Mag Silver, and some of the data that we had in there uh, highlighted uh, some very high grade structures um, that turned out to be what um, had not been drilled but had a program designed on them uh, by Pan American Silver. Um, we have, like I said, an option to acquire 100% ownership. However, it's the only license in our entire portfolio that we don't have an option to repurchase the 2% NSR. Uh, we think that speaks to the strength of the project and what Pan American feels about the project. Um, but we do have a pretty clear defined path of what we're trying to do with our exploration on this asset. Um, the project area is broken down into three blocks, the north, the Panuco deposit, uh, and then, or sorry, the Panuco block, which was drilled by Pan American on a couple occasions and returned some very high grade silver results. Central Lucita block, which includes the Palenque vein system, the Palenque and, and, uh, and San Pascual vein system, which is an over four kilometer strike length of, uh, of a mineral system. And then the sort of Southern block, which abuts our, our, uh, our San Ocasio deposit area. Um, we started drilling this property in November, 2021. Uh, we're still continued drilling. I think we're on the 12th hole onto this property right now. And that was what our news release was really about the other day, just giving an update. We're over 3,000 meters of drilling to this property. Uh, we'll do about 4,500 meters of drilling and then sort of step back and have a bit of a technical review to design the program from there. Um, our thesis of this was to test and screen the property, first with a, a large mapping campaign and then by followed up diamond drilling on approximately one kilometer centers across the system. As I said, you know, this maps up to uh, hole 2210, um, but we're actually uh, another two holes into the system right now, basically stepping along the entire length of the Palenque San Pascual vein system, um, as we feel it's a very robust emerging vein camp. It's got a lot of historical surface, a, uh, surface results, um, up to 700 grams per ton silver. There's lots of old surface workings, little shafts, underground workings kind of all over the place on this property. And our target was identified through a regional targeting program, but then as well a mapping program that went uh, that was underway until about December last year. Um, Infrastructure is great on this asset as well. It abuts our Santa Casio license, it abuts our Tawadis license, which we also have a couple holes into, and uh, uh, Mexican Toll Highway and Autopista cross cuts of this property and Santa Casio property. Again, there's roads everywhere. We mostly drill off of existing disturbed roads, uh, power to the site, and uh, like I said, we've done about 3,000 meters of drilling. Um, ongoing with this is a technical review on the Panuco licenses, um, as the historical drilling done by Pan American Silver in 2011 came back with some pretty substantial high grade mineralization. And most recently, Zacatecas Silver uh, drilled along the property boundary of our pro project and came back with some 800 gram per ton plus material over there. And they have a substantial drill program plan uh, adjacent to our Panuco licenses. So um, we're, we're quite 
um, positive and quite optimistic about the future of this asset. Like I said, we'll screen the whole property, test as many vein structures as possible, and then determine what the phase two of drilling will be. After that, we'll bring the drill back into the main San Casio area, which is where you can see the historic drill, or sorry, the current drilling to the south, uh, and then begin to test the extent of that main system. So busy year in Zacatecas for the, you know, for the next 12 months. So what's our strategy? We know discovery-focused geoscience works. It's worked at our neighbor's capstone, uh, 3,000 meters into the mineral system. It worked fabulously for Fresnio and their uh, joint venture partners, Mag Silver at Juan Ocepio, as well as the main Fresnio structures. Um, and we're fully financed to do that. We have a very good team of people, very strong team of technical people here in Mexico. Um, and at the end of the day, we're trying to add ounces to an advanced asset. Our regional drill program started in November on the Lucita licenses. We've done over 3,000 meters there. Uh, I suspect we'll get to 4,500 meters quite quickly. And like I said, focused in on Tawade, San Pascual, Palenque, and El Puerto. Um, and then we'll move the drill back over to Veda Grana to follow up on those high grade results that we put out earlier this year. So that's our, uh, you know, our, our one project, but uh, adding to that is uh, to Paul Goldcopper project. So, um, so Paul was an acquisition, sort of a merger acquisition by Defiance in 2018. It used to be in a company called Geologics Resources or Geologics Exploration. Uh, some of you may remember that company as at the height of the last gold bull market in 2011. As a single asset company, Geologics had an over $200 million market cap on this asset alone. Um, we have 100% ownership, including an option to repurchase a 2.5% ownership, which we're paying down currently. We entered into that option uh, earlier last year. It has a large resource on it, uh, 1.8 million ounces gold, 813 million pounds of copper, of course, 100% ownership of that measured and indicated resource. Um, it's got a long exploration history. It was found by uh, INCO in the 1960s, uh, HECLA and tech su subsequent work programs. And then it sat in the hands of a junior and then geologics who all in spent over $27 million with over 60,000 meters of drilling. It's got a PFS done in 2012, a PEA done in 2013, and an updated PEA was done in 2017. Um, there's infrastructure is great. You can drive to it from Guadalajara. It's about a four and a half hour drive southwest of Guadalajara. And the two closest deep sea shipping facilities, one of them is the largest concentrate shipping facility on the west coast of Mexico. And the other, Lazaro Cardenas, is another large deep sea shipping port. Um, surface rights in most of the deposit area is held by private landowners as opposed to your traditional Mexico sort of three tiered ownership that you have, like we do in Zacatecas here, where you have private uh, sort of a group of people, or you have a keto ownership, which is more community ownership. So, um, and that's part of the strategy of this asset is to uh, get long-term surface rights agreements so that you can take this from what on paper looks like a shovel-ready project to actually a shovel-ready project. The PEA that was done in 2017 demonstrates some pretty robust economics uh, at gold price of $12.50 and a copper price of $2.50. It's got a post-tax MPV of $169 million, uh, post-tax IRR of 24%, and a 2.3 year payback of initial $214 million capex. So pretty low barrier of entry for this asset as well. At $1,500 or at $1,500 gold and $3 copper, that post-tax MPV doubles to $345 million. As Chris says, this, pro this project and well most metals assets, but this project particularly is highly leveraged to the underlying commodity. Every $250 increase in the price of gold adds, 100, or adds, 200, adds $100 million to the post-tax MPV. So every $250 million increase adds $100 million to the post-tax MPV of this asset. Um, we see this asset as being a potential 10-year, 100,000 ounce a year producer. And that's by adding ounces to the back end through the organic addition of ounces through exploration and resource conversion, as well as... Uh, substantial exploration targets outside of that main um, resource area. We don't want to push the ounces from the front end into the back end of this mine life as those front end ounces add to the two or, or you know, benefit the low payback period of this uh, mine life from the 2017 PEA. Um, that being said, it's quite a tidy operation, production averaging over 79,000 ounces of gold, 32 million pounds of copper over 10 years. Add an all-in sustaining cost, and again, this is from the 2017 PEA, so it's starting to get a bit stale dated, but uh, all in sustaining costs of $396 per ounce. So low cash quartile in Mexico, as well as a low barrier of entry, as I mentioned, $214 million an ounce. So how are we going to pull a rabbit out of the hat and add to that back end mine life? You can see here, we're looking for some places about 50,000 ounces of gold per year. So over the last 12 months, particularly led by Dr. Stephanie Sikora, we've been remodeling this whole project and we've been targeting, you know, creating specific targets where we see as immediate resource building targets, but then also life of mine exploration targets. 
Uh, Stephanie broke this project down into two blocks. It looks to be an intact porphyry epithermal system that sits on a major crustal scale fault. This major crustal scale fault is uh, the one in the south of this image, going from the top right-hand side of the image to the bottom left-hand side of the image. It's deep-seated. We know it's a trans-lithospheric fault, fault, so very big, very deep-seated. Uh, perfect place for a porphyry epithermal system to form. The west block is our porphyry block. And the center block looks to be a bit higher up in the system, so more epithermal in nature, and it has higher grade gold, higher grade silver mineralization. Um, we see the west block as being able to, as presenting the most um, clear path to resource expansion, particularly in the south zone, which sits on that crustal scale first order fault, which is at the intersection of a second order fault. So speaking in the geology world, that's a great place for a mineral system to be uh, present. Um, we doubled the land position as well on the property in, uh, in earlier last year. Um, and that covered a couple of exploration targets that seem to have the same structural setting as these west and center blocks. And they are earlier stage targets, but they do fit into our expedition profile. So what does the south zone mean for resource expansion? Um, the south zone is a high grade pit. It has a five year mine life. So it fits in that back end mine life. You exhaust your resources at the end of that year five in here. However, there's substantial drilling uh, well below the current pit design. So the PEA is modeled on measured and indicated ounces only and not on inferred ounces, which we do have inferred ounces on the property. But one thing that should be you know, taken note of is this is that uh, deep seated structure, this east northeast striking fault. It's a crustal scale fault. And the deepest hole into this property, into this part of the property, into this porphyry part of the property, is 188 meters of a gram gold and 0.38% copper. And it triples the vertical profile of mineralization almost three times below the approximate base of the current pit shell design. So it's a logical target to follow up with, particularly because it's the highest value NSR rock per ton as modeled in the 2012 PFS. Um, along with this property, which of course is a logical exploration target, both in the resource conversion, taking inferred ounces and moving them into a measured indicated category through confidence drilling and upgraded drilling, testing this thing is deemed possible. We know this fault strikes deep or, or, or has very deep roots, a uh, major fault, and so Typically, there is, a, or, or we'll say there's a high confidence, high degree of confidence that there is existing mineralization below here, particularly because mineralization looks to be increasing in grade and in alteration at depth, getting into a hotter or more, you know, prospective area for poor fruit mineralization. The other, and we'll call this life of mine or sort of uh, developing exploration targets, uh, we're calling them more epithermal in flavor. They're uh, much higher grade gold, much higher grade silver, as opposed to the modeled deposit. Um, they sit adjacent to the pits of the current uh, Tizate zone, which is a higher level um, structure. And it looks to be more of a higher level in place, porphyry, and much more of an epithermal, kind of a shallower uh, emplacement to the system. Again, it sits on a major crustal scale fault, in fact, on the break of a major crustal scale fault. And we believe that the Tizate pit may have actually been modeled as, or may have been not correctly modeled in that it could just be an alteration, a big alteration halo of a more high sulfidation type so, uh, silver gold system. Um, that being said, when there has been drilling that has hit these uh, higher grade gold structures up to 25 grams gold, 565 grams silver, and then we've been doing a lot of geophysical remodeling here as well, uh, putting together some targets outside of that main Tezate pit. Uh, the corridor of mineralization here grades up to five grams gold and 150 grams silver at surface and it's got a lot of uh coincidental uh I, or coincidental geophysical anomalies as well so um, we like the prospectivity of both expanding the known resource areas but then demonstrating that there's strong exploration potential for the life of mine and beyond on this property so just to kind of run back to the 50,000 foot view on defiant silver um we do have a robust resource base Base. Uh, at Tapal, we have uh, 1.8 million ounces of gold measured and indicated, 813 million pounds of copper. We also have some gold and copper in the inferred categories as well. Uh, we have significant exploration potential of both assets. San Acasio, we've gotten about 250 meters below the current resource estimate, hitting what is the highest grade material the company has hit to date in Zacatecas. Um, we're demonstrating strong exploration potential in the district. We have a 40 square kilometer land position in, in the Zacatecas district. And uh, that makes us about the second largest landowner in the area. Uh, we have a team of people that have done this before. We've taken projects from exploration success through to M&A and mine development. Uh, we have a team of people in Mexico, a management and a senior technical team of people with uh, combined over 100 years of operating experience here in Mexico from advanced exploration through to mining operations. So a very rich group of people that have a, a brain trust of information on how to operate successfully in Mexico. 
Uh, every $250 increase to the price of gold, that's $100 million to the post-tax MPV. As Chris says, it is a bit of a cliche to say that your project, your precious metal project and your metals project has, uh, has uh, uh, leverage to the under metal, underlying commodity, but we do see that as a very palpable number within our uh, current PEA done in 2017. Uh, about 35% management key shareholders, including the CEO and his funds at Windermere Capital, which own over 20% of the company. So a lot of skin in the game. And really our end goal is to deliver as much shareholder return as we can as possible. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, the, the motto or the MO for the company is drive as much shareholder return as we can through effective and successful discovery focused exploration and development. And we're doing it right now. We're drilling. I'm sitting in Zacatecas right now. We did 3,000 meters of drilling on a property that's never been drilled before in one of the world's most prolific silver mining jurisdictions. Uh, we're going to get to the 4,500 meter mark quite quickly, drill back over to the Veda Grande area, and then design our phase two follow-up plan for the Lucita properties. Um, it's nice that we're fully financed to do that moving forward. And so the next catalyst to look for in the company are, you know, upcoming drill results with the Lucita property, upcoming drill results with the main Beta Grande area, you know, more development focused results within the main camp because we are doing this city access underground program uh, to get into the main heart of the system, as well as ongoing uh, more strategic initiatives the company are sitting behind here with, uh, with our other projects in the area. So that I will leave with an encouragement to follow us on all of our social media accounts, reach out to us directly. We love getting questions. We love having to uh, the opportunity to speak with interested parties, whether it's about Mexico, whether it's about exploration, uh, shareholders, interested shareholders. Um, you can find us on all the social media channels, check out our website, add yourself to our mailing list. Uh, pretty easy to track down myself. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out directly. And without anything else, uh, I'd love to turn it over for some Q&A. Great. Thank you very much, Chris and Doug, for a very informative presentation. Uh, we'll now move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. A reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. And we already do have a few questions. Um, uh, first, when do you think uh, drilling results will be available uh, from the current program? Yeah, so we're starting starting to see results trickle in. Uh, the first two holes we drilled were actually on the Tawade structure, which is a project. It's one of the oldest licenses, oldest, longest held tenure licenses that the company has. Um, it abuts the Pan American licenses that we optioned. And we put a couple holes into there because there's some very interesting underground workings in that area. So those were really first pass screening holes. Um, those results are starting to trickle in. We have a prep facility in Zacatecas, so we get a pretty quick turnaround from the lab. We don't have to get in, in the line to prep our samples at the main uh, ALS labs in Vancouver or in Ireland. So we send them pulps, get the assays, and we've seen results as quick as four weeks, but we're kind of aiming at that three-month level. So um, we are seeing results come in from the November phase of drilling, and then we did another uh, bunch of holes in December as well. And so I'd expect that we'll have a pretty steady flow of information starting in the next few weeks. Um, Results will be ongoing as we are drilling ongoing, um, and we will update. Um, we try not to put out single whole news releases, paint a bit of a picture, uh, sort of show what our strategy is in the area. But um, as we see, you know, if markets are sorry, if the labs become a little bit more backed up, we may just be in a position that we have to try and get some more information about the general market. Great. And one question here that kind of relates obviously you're in an existing mining camp and at this point you're more at, a, at an exploration stage but you know if this does if you do eventually bring this uh, project into production would you you know would you envision it as needing a standalone mill or or would this be something where you could do uh where you could take advantage of of existing mills in the area well there's certainly one of the benefits of being in a world-class mining jurisdiction is that there is a tremendous amount of optionality with the asset um, currently, as, as I mentioned, we are looking at a safe access underground program into the heart of the historic mining, uh, hoping to be able to use, you know, some advantages to being underground. Um, there is toll milling facilities nearby. There are private mills nearby as well. Um, there is uh, opportunity there. Um, we always believe that the strength and characteristic of the ore body is always more important than the mill that you have on site. If you don't have a good ore body, the mill is not very valuable. So we 
Um, certainly have looked at a number of opportunities and in the past people have used those opportunities and it does you know, present a pretty good case for uh, maybe a quicker profile to production. But our focus is right now to get as much confidence on the deposit and the deposit characteristics as possible and then go begin to look at what is around. But this is a, as, a, as a kind of a, a note, within 50 kilometers of the project, there's over 25,000 tons of milling capacity that is designed to process these ores. So it is a uh, it is certainly on our radar and is certainly some of the um, you know advantage to operating where we are. But uh, first things first, let's just get a really good understanding of the system and the ore body or the potential ore body, and then uh, from there we can make those decisions. Great. And looking here at at obviously you're now now drilling at uh, Lucida. Um, what past we're and you had mentioned that there's the past uh, you know small scale mining operations and things, but what past exploration work was done there, and how I guess what are you targeting specifically uh, with this drilling? So we're targeting what we think is an emerging vein district in the Zac or vein system in the Zacatecas district. Um, they're big structures. Uh, there's really good surface geochemistry there. In the 1980s and early 2000s, or maybe it was the early 90s, but anyways, the 2011 was the last drill program that was done in the northern part of our area, which is, includes the on-strike extension of the Panuco deposit, which is being drilled by Pac Silver right now, and they are getting some nice results. Uh, those veins extend onto our property. Pan American drilled them in 2011 and came back with high-grade silver results. So we, uh, we know the potential up there. Uh, for us with Lucita, it's the central block. It's never seen any drill holes. Uh, we have a, a great under, well, we'll say for a first pass understanding, um, we have a great geologic map. We have a, a, a decent understanding of the stratigraphy from surface. It's still, you know, as you get drill holes into the, uh, into the third dimension, uh, you do learn a lot of other things. Um, but for us to screen the whole vein system, um, on that asset alone, on that central block alone, there's over 20 kilometers of vein strike length that has never seen a drill hole before. So it's very rare that you would step into a district that's this well mineralized, this well known with this kind of production history and not um, have a drill hole into that area. Um, we were able to get permits in about 12 days to drill it because of our existing relationship with the uh, Ejido and Fresconamentos in the area. So pretty quick for us to be able to mobilize on that. But we wanted to get that first phase of mapping done so we knew where all the veins were and then we could just move across the system. Uh, we use a track mounted drill. It's a small, light, fast machine and we get really good production numbers from it as well. And we're able to set up and drill in sort of less than three hours. We had a drill move, that's, uh, or sorry, our last drill move took less than three hours from pulling rods, from shooting the hole, or from being the uh, downhole survey and then pulling the rods to the uh, So a quick, nimble, agile exploration across a, a emerging vein district in one of the world's most prolific silver camps. Great. Um, and then when you return to drilling in the San Acasio area, will you primarily be focused on uh, further mineralization below historic workings or are there other targets uh, there that you would look at? Both, yeah, we have what, uh, what we'll call it the South uh, East extension target, which uh, mineralization and mining ends quite abruptly. Um, and even for a, a epithermal system, you know, it looks like it's quite faulted off and, and uh, you would you would still see even if you were out of the mineralization you typically still see some type of veining and we're just not seeing that at surface and we think there's a quite a large offset to that and um we've been focused in on that so that's a true kind of brownfields exploration target outside of the historic mining i'm um, also testing what we think is the control to mineralization in the veda grande system and testing the limits of that system uh, epithermal nature epithermal systems are zoned in nature so you you're not going to have mineralization outside of the zonation of the mineralization events and so testing where is that sweet spot of mineralization uh, with the knowledge of the controls of mineralization which we found out identified through mapped uh, geology at surface um, old historic underground um, modeling from the historic workings as well as uh, oriented core drilling which gives you a real-time uh, structural uh, position of the vein system and so putting those three things together we started to really kind of key into what the control of mineralization is both in the historic stokes but then as well as these building mineralized bodies uh, as we released earlier or mid 2021. Great. 
And then shifting back to Tapal, and you had gone over uh, some of the plans there, but will you be doing um, exploration work there uh, in 2022? Uh, we certainly hope to. The um, current initiative right now for us is to establish the key parameters that are required for your long-term surface mining operations. So long-term surface access, um, looking at the resource upgrade, how to design the program around that, and then getting in and completing that work. So there's a few strategic initiatives that we're working on and very diligently working on that are going to guide our timing for exploration on that asset. Um, we have very clearly defined targets that are well within our resource area, or we'll say within the um, dimensions of the resource area. And so when we do get uh, onto the ground or we do initiate that exploration program, I think it's going to be pretty fast for us to get things uh, get things demonstrated or test the test the concepts and the uh, the models that we've built on that project. So I'd like to say it's going to happen in a certain period of time, but it's really we're letting some of the um, some of the behind the scenes uh, and it's heavy lifting um, guide our timing. Um, and hopefully in 2022, you'll see a drill spin on top. Great. Um, and one question here, generally on, on Mexico and the overall uh, climate toward, toward mining there, there's been a little bit of concern in recent months with uh, permits for our, an operating mine that seemed to be denied and, and then came back perhaps. Um, have you seen, has that, any of that affected you at all or are you able to, to do your work as, as you need? So um, we're in one of the principal mining centers of Mexico. Um, rarely do you hear negative news related to permits in the Zacatecas, Durangos, Chihuahua, Sonora, uh, Sinaloa. Rarely do you hear um, much on the negative news flow from respect to permitting and, and social license with mining operations. Uh, mining is the largest contributor to GDP in the state of Zacatecas. Zacatecas is the largest silver producing state in Mexico and Mexico is the largest silver producing state uh, country in the world. Um, Mexico is a huge country. It is very geographically and culturally diverse. You have uh, agriculture rich areas, you have tourism rich areas, you have um, industry rich areas like manufacturing and then you have mining centers. And they all have a different opinion and a different outlook on the mining industry and the effects of the mining industry. Um, what's happening in Oaxaca State is not the same as what's happening in Zacatecas State. And what's happening in Zacatecas State is probably more similar to what's happening in Sonora. Um, you have some of the largest deposit types of their asset class in Mexico that are currently being exploited. Um, we were able to receive permits for drilling on our Lucita property in 12 days from submission. Um, I think it takes a very clear and very open line of communication with yourself, with the authorities, the uh, you know, jurisdictional authorities, uh, your local municipal government, your local municipal communities, and then as well your state and then federal government. So um, for us, uh, we, we think it's a wonderful place to explore. There's mines being built, there's mines being developed. Uh, Camino Rojo is about two hours north of us. Uh, that is under production right now. I believe they may have poured their first bars, but don't quote me, I could be wrong about that. But even the pre Mexican president was visiting at Penasquito last year, uh, prior to the uh, last uh, federal election, um, and saying, you know, this is, the, this is how you do good business in the mining industry in Mexico. So I think it really needs to be uh, understood that the size and the the, uh, the uh, size and the um, the difference in, in in cultural and geographical and economic um, diversity in Mexico is is something to really consider when you're looking at the country for its uh, uh, wealth and prosperity in mining. Great. And kind of a general corporate question here, but thinking ahead. You know, what is the long term strategy for the company? Obviously, you've got two assets that that you have the exploration, but they both look like the kind of thing that could be could be developed. Um, do you want to move forward in the development pipeline, maybe become a producer? Or are you looking, I, I guess, what is um, are you looking to to potentially partner or sell after after uh, de-risking the projects? And that's a very good question, Tim. And, and it's something that we talk about really quite often internally, but the, the reality is our mandate from our shareholders is, is to be that of an exploration company. We are really focused on adding ounces and, you know, we, 
I think we're fortunate in that we have we have, we do have two very valuable assets that have a lot of un, uh, a lot of value that have yet to be unlocked. So as uh, you know, obviously the uh, the market environment is has uh, has and will continue to be volatile. We really have no control over that. What we can control is what we do every day, and and uh, you know we get up and we continue to push these these assets forward. The goal of the company is to have these both of these projects in the best possible position um, when that sector turn comes and we do get maximum valuation. Um, how we're going to be able to unlock that in any, you know, in, in, in that environment is, it remains to be seen, you know, but all options are available. Whether that means to partner with somebody, whether that means to uh, sell it, whether that means to spin it out, um, Whatever is going to deliver the maximum return for our shareholders is what what we're going to pursue. Great. And uh, I think that's all the questions. I'd ask kind of a uh, kind of a closing question here myself. But just to review, what what news would we look forward to uh, in the coming weeks and months from Defiance? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I think Doug touched on it uh, pretty, pretty clearly. There was we were running through sort of the drilling program, and that's that's uh, I think where you're going to see a lot of the, the near-term news flow. We've uh, we've got holes that have uh, that are in at the labs. We're starting to see uh, some results trickle back. It's uh, not as simple as the results just coming back and throwing in a news release. There's a lot of analysis that needs to go into into the data and the results that we get back, and modeling that and and really seeing where we're at. We don't. We're really trying to change the philosophy of the company in, in that we're not looking to just sort of drill and, and slam as much news in the market as we possibly can. We're, we're trying to define an ore body here. We're trying to find ounces. We're going to do our work. We're going to be uh, very uh, deliberate and pragmatic about our approach. And when we have something meaningful uh, to report to the market, we'll put it out. Um, and we're, we're, now, we're an exploration company. We expect to be to be drilling uh, not for X number of meters, but perpetually drilling until we get to the point where we have an asset and a resource that's defined enough to be able to maximize that value for our shareholders. Great. Um, well, I'd like to again thank uh, Chris Wright and Doug Cavey from Defiance for presenting today. And thank you everyone out there for tuning in and for your questions today. Uh, just a reminder that Red Cloud Securities will be back next Tuesday afternoon when our webinar series continues uh, with West Mining presenting Tuesday, February 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, have a great rest of your day.